we've sort of made like our romantic partner everything for us. They're right. like, you know, my confidant, my therapist, <laughs> my travel right. buddy, my, but here's the, the challenging aspect of that. Um, when I am the parental figure for my partner, there's not a lot of eros. There's not a lot of yeah. life force. We don't want to sleep together, right? right? And so this is why all of the couples that I see, because we <laughs> put so much emphasis on attachment, everybody's struggling with their physical intimacy because there's like this enmeshed dynamic in our relationships. We need that sense of longing, that desire. It's like, if I don't sort of believe that you're like meant to be this other, all of a sudden, I can't desire you, you know? Welcome to Deeply Well, a soft place to land on your journey, a podcast for those that are curious, creative, and ready to expand in higher consciousness and self-care. I'm Debbie Brown. This is where we heal. This is where we become. Welcome to today's show. Okay, we are going to get into some new territory that we haven't really explored, actually, in so many seasons of Deeply Well relationships. This is an area that we have kind of dabbled in a little bit, but it is my number one most requested type of show to do. And I'm really excited today because we have someone so special that has an incredible new book out that is going to guide us through what it is to be in healthy relationship and to also be a sovereign being, mm. which if you're on this path and you're listening to this show, I can almost guarantee that that is the intention and that is what we are always exploring here. But it doesn't mean that you have to be off on that island all alone. So we are going to be learning today. We're going to be expanding. Highly recommend grabbing a journal. Highly recommend um, bringing something supportive nearby just in case some things start to come up. Today's episode, we are joined by Danae Logan. She is a marriage and family therapist with an orientation in depth psychology, often referred to as the psychology of the soul. She's a group facilitator and a co-host of the podcast, Cheaper Than Therapy. She has a master's degree in counseling psychology and is notably the mentee of acclaimed psychotherapist, Esther Perel. Danae is passionate about sharing tools and strategies to cultivate spiritual awareness, understanding the current shifts taking place within our societal structures, and empowering others in understanding how they can live the most fulfilling lives possible. Her debut book, Sovereign Love, hits everywhere. So go to all the places that you love to get books. And it is from Sounds True. Welcome to the show. Oh my gosh, Debbie, thank you. Your voice is just so lovely. And I'm mm. listening to you as you're doing that intro. I'm like, you're like a soft place to live. <laughs> to love yourself. I'm like, I'm just going to like sit back with Debbie and listen to you speak. It's so uh, don't be making me blush. <laughs> thank you so much. It, um, yeah, part of my journey has been using my voice in the way that I believe God wants me mm. to. So I really appreciate that so much. Beautiful. This is a big, uh, whew, this is a big category of life. Big conversation. <laughs> yeah. And I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Um, I think kind of grounding it, I'll, I'll ground it first with a little, a little share in that as a lot of listeners from this show know, um, well, I am a sovereign being. That is my path. Mm. And I have been deeply learning about love since I got divorced about three and a half years ago. Mm. And it's been so illuminating kind of coming to that space of loving and being open to be loved mm. from the position of being at the depth of healing I am currently at, the depth of the depth of self, the depth of connection, consciousness, Um but even in all of that, and I think this is the funny thing um, for so many of us where it's like you're on the journey. Mm -hmm. So you're like, while I'm on the journey, so then all of life is going to be great. It's <laughs> like, and we're still on earth. Right. And we're still surrounded by everyone who has their own spiritual curriculum and mm. are at different places of that journey. And so this is still an area that 
can be deeply nourished by intention and work and thoughtfulness and care and cultivating. So I'm so excited to explore that with you. Mm -hmm. Your book, Sovereign Love, first of all, the title. Can you walk me through that definition? What is sovereign love? Oof. You know, I think so much of what you were just saying speaks to why I decided to title this book Sovereign Love, because mm. so much of what we have understood up to this point about love and relationships has really been designed or um, constructed by an external authority telling us what relationships should be, should look like, um, what is, quote, normal in our relationship structures, right? And what I think we're finding in accordance with what you were saying is as we really do a lot of this like deeper work and attempt to know ourselves well and define ourselves for ourselves, there's a lot that's sort of out of alignment in terms of the way that we are loving one another. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I certainly witness it within the couples that I work with every day, but also within my own life. I was a yoga teacher for so many years. And it's so funny, Debbie, people used to say to me all the time, like, oh my gosh, your husband must just like love coming home to you. You're like you're <laughs> soothing, you know, energy and you're just like so loving. And I was like, oh, totally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally yeah. does, right? <laughs> um, and that wasn't the case, right? Like there were so many aspects mm. of my own shadow that were sort of playing out in my relationship dynamics, which is the case for all of us. But I think we have been living in what I speak to in this book that I wrote, um, a really wounded masculine paradigm for centuries now. And um, when I talk about a masculine paradigm or when I talk about patriarchy, I'm not talking about masculinity in the context of gender so much as I'm talking about structures of dominance, right? Mm. Um, and there's a way that we are doing relationships from a really sort of wounded masculine perspective, which is like how it looks on the outside versus like how it really feels deep within us, um, whether we're in alignment with the people that we really want to be versus like mm. acting out all of these paradigms that are really based in fear. And so as my marriage ended, um, and I like to say changed form because mm my kiddo's dad is still one of my best friends in the world. And I think we were both really committed to how do we do this thing of allowing this relationship to evolve? And it did need to evolve. We got married when we were, you know, fairly young, like mid twenties and realized that after being together for 12 years, it was just not true anymore. There was so much about who each of us wanted to be and mm. where our lives were headed that just weren't aligned. And so much of what we're taught about relationships is that like when a relationship ends, that means we failed, right? Right. And we should be devastated and we should feel like that means we're not lovable or all of these narratives that we're taught to believe um, about ourselves that, you know, is you were speaking to and I did within myself a lot of work that made me feel like that's just not true in terms of like how this really feels and who I really want to be as I'm holding this certainly what I want my my child to witness about yeah. um the dissolution of our marriage but if that's not true how do we do the work of defining what is true for ourselves so you know sovereign circling back to what you originally asked is this sort of entity that is defined for itself, right? If you think about like sovereign countries, they are like doing the work of defining themselves for themselves. And it's like a co-creation of the people involved, but it's really mm. like that inner authority is defining it, you know? <sighs> you know, I would like to say that the a lot of the audience of this show is deeply on the path of self-awareness and seekers, mm -hmm. you know, curious, um, as I say in the title of the show, creative, but deeply connected to finding truths and answers. And I think something that uh, I hear a lot from people is there is this belief that you have to, quote unquote, I'm doing like all the air quotes right yeah. now, be healed to be in relationship. Mm. If you could just kind of, <laughs> I don't even know what the question is, but mm -hmm. explore and kind of share your thoughts on that concept or how to approach relationship um, when you are on this journey and you are doing your inner work and you're noticing the triggers and all the all the pieces. Yeah. Well, it's 
It's twofold because first I would say, you know, the idea that I need to be healed before being in a relationship, I would sort of say, well, good luck with that, right? Yeah. <laughs> there is nothing. The work never ends. Right? <laughs> and there's nothing that will bring our stuff to the surface like romantic relationships because yeah. it's the most vulnerable space within us to stand in front of another person and say, can you love me? Like, can you see me as worthy of traveling this path alongside you. it's It brings all of our inner child wounding to the surface. It's the right. most vulnerable space for all of us. So I'm like, I don't care who you are. Like I <laughs> certainly, like when I got back in there, I'm like, who am I? Like I don't even recognize what is coming up for me because it's, it's deeply activating for all of us. So I think yeah. we have to normalize that, yeah, it's going to be activating. It's going to be hard. Um, and I think if we're open to seeing it this way, relationships can also be the most rich soil for our becoming and our evolution. And mm -hmm. it's really sort of seeing whatever the relationship dynamic is as showing me to me, right? Um, so if I make it less about this other person and what they're doing, what they need to change and how they're not showing up in, quote, meeting my needs. Um, right. And more like being in the inquiry around, oof, that's that's really challenging for me when this person does that. I wonder why, right? Like what is the story I'm telling myself about what it means? Where did I get ideas about who someone else should be for me in mm. relationship that maybe – are maybe they're true, but maybe they're not necessarily true for me. Um, and how can I just like really be present with what is and in the space of questioning versus just allowing our inner child really to run the show in those moments when we're inevitably activated in relationships, you know? Oh my goodness. Just something that you said in the midst of this, I, I would love to kind of touch on because I think you know, in this in this moment in time, we are incredibly blessed to have a lot of access to information and language, mm -hmm. a lot of access to um, concepts and tools of self awareness, diagnoses, and mm -hmm. so many things, <laughs> all from our Instagram algorithm. Yes, um, but we don't always, you know, depending on what our individual backgrounds are, have the same definitions for some of these words mm. that we're reading or these understandings. And so sometimes they're misused. And one of the things that I see a lot is people saying, you know, I need to get my needs met <laughs> or I need, I, my partner needs to meet my needs. Yes. <sighs> and Perfect. yeah, I'm like, and it's, I will, the floor is yours. I'm like I'm <laughs> smiling so big as you say that, that my face just, I'm like, she's my people. Um, <laughs> because I feel like very similar to what you're describing. Um, I was watching the landscape of social media and how often, and not even just social media, just in general, the relationship sphere and the way that people talk about relationships, it's almost become like a tick talking about like getting our needs met. And yeah. I found when couples come in to see me, it's literally a battle for who's not getting their needs, needs met, excuse me, appropriately to the point where I'm like, God, this really feels just like the least loving thing ever. And also what I realized was we're competing for energy here. Mm. We're each feeling like I need someone else to fill up right. my, my love cup. And I think people even actually describe it that way, but like fill me up energetically so that I can feel something that I don't feel within myself, right? Mm. But if I need someone else to be filling up my cup for me to be whole, it's like a cup with a, you know, a hole in the bottom where it just yeah. keeps streaming out. It will never be enough. And so our work is really, from my perspective, to cork that um, that cup ourselves by really being in that questioning. And, you know, I struggle with the word needs. And a lot of times it's not that we don't have relational needs. Um, but what I realized was I was married for 12 years and there were so many things that I would have called my relational needs that I realized once I wasn't in a relationship, those weren't needs. They mm. were desires. They were, you know, things that I longed to feel in a partnership. I'm not wrong for feeling them or longing for them, but they were actually things that I was able to do for myself when I had no choice, right? Um, right. And I often say, like, how do single people meet these needs if they're actually, quote, needs? And I, I think language matters because there's an energetic that is evoked within us when we use certain languages 
language. And if these are my needs, then a lot of times what I find with couples is there's a little bit of a level of entitlement that comes up um, towards our partner. Like you're not meeting my needs. These are things that I need right. from you versus always holding um, as a practice. This partnership is a sacred gift that I'm not promised could conceivably not be here tomorrow. And having someone who sees me and meets me and has the desire to love me in that way is to me like the greatest gift ever, you know, yeah. not everybody has that. And yeah. so I think there's a way that I just like to like play with the language a little bit. Like if I express this to my partner it is a desire, how does that feel different than this is the need that I have from you that's not being met? Because there's a little bit of an energetic of lack sometimes yeah. in it, the word it need. plunges into deficiency. <clears throat> yes. Absolutely. It's so, God, I, I think like, and what you're speaking to is just so big. It's mm -hmm. so big because I think this, these kind of conversations about both needs and attachment styles mm -hmm. are kind of, um, some of it's really good, the <laughs> stuff you find. Some of it is kind of like, oh, you were going to, you might be sabotaging, you know, what, oh. what you really want and desire yeah. in your life. Um, and you know, with, uh, what you were speaking to with the needs piece that I find so interesting is like when I kind of reemerged in the dating world and I was having conversations with people that are single or had been single for a length of time, I was mm -hmm. married for about 10 years. So I was off the market and didn't know, you know, I didn't know how to use apps, nothing. I was like, <laughs> what, what are, what are the kids doing? Right. Um, but I started noticing that I, as I was talking to women who were single and some men, there was this, um, what kind of became apparent to me was that a lot of people were actually looking for parental love. She gets it. <laughs> Obsessed with you. Yes. Yes. Debbie, because you are so spot many on. of the needs that I, I was hearing so many girlfriends say they needed, it it wasn't really rational or reasonable to expect that in a lover or in a partner mm. or in a relationship of equality, but it did seem like one of those core deeply held desires that you would have in childhood of the way you'd want your authority figure or your protector to show up. That's right. And it seemed almost as I was hearing that, you know, and there's no judgment in that because this is our work of this lifetime, right? It's to be aware of these things and where they came from. But you know, the thing that was kind of striking to me was just by approaching love in that way, you keep yourself from it. Oof. Just felt that in my whole body as you said that. <clears throat> That's right. So yeah. for what are like realistic needs for someone to have from a partner and what could potentially be something that one, you can do for yourself or you might want to investigate maybe a childhood belief. Well, I want to go back if we can for just a second, because what you said was so big and so important. And to me <clears throat> is such a, um, a fundamental reason why I wrote this book, because there's mm. so much about the relationship structures right now that are really attachment based in nature. And all of us as human beings have two fundamental needs. We all need attachment. We need um, something to feel tethered to something that we feel like contained by and like grounded in security. But we also need aliveness. We also need mm. a sense of eros and life force and becoming and evolution, right? And so the the structure, the attachment is the masculine in the context of the way I talk about it. Yeah. In these energetics, the aliveness, the eros, the life force is the feminine. We live in a society that really does not hold a lot of value around the feminine energetics in general, right? And so there's been so much emphasis on just create the structure, just create the safety. People actually like talk about it like just get in that bunker of marriage and stay <laughs> there and everything will be okay. And in a lot of ways, it's like, if we put the emphasis on a secure attachment and that's it, we're out of balance. As you're speaking mm. to, we're looking for someone to essentially, yes, be a parent, but I would say even the next step up from that is like be that higher power for me, right? Wow. Like that that source of wow. like here's where I get my um, existu existential angst sort of calmed. All of like I noticed there was like, oh, this is like anxiety. This is almost like 
addictive, repetitive patterns of like, I need someone else to soothe me. Um, and when you're a child, as you know, as a mama, that's like, that is what your parent is meant to do. They are meant yeah. to give you that sense of containment. I'm here. I got you. Right. But if our ch children never develop that, and then they sort of go through the world with an insecure attachment, feeling like they're not safe. Now, I believe there is a larger secure attachment that we are meant to um, cultivate within ourselves, right? But that is that is that integration of source and um, the feminine aspects of ourselves with us being rooted in the world that we're living in, right? So to answer the initial question that you asked, what do I need from a partner? I would say very little, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I would say that having people in our lives are, again, this thing that we've sort of made like our romantic partner everything for us. They're right. like, you know, my confidant, my therapist, <laughs> my travel right. buddy. my. But here's the, the challenging aspect of that. Um, when I am the parental figure for my parent, or excuse me, parental figure for my partner, all of a sudden, appropriately, appropriately so, there's not a lot of eros. There's not a lot of yeah. life force. We don't want to sleep together, right? right? And so this is why all of the couples that I see, because yeah. we put so much emphasis on attachment, everybody's struggling with their physical intimacy because there's like this enmeshed dynamic in our relationships where it's like, I don't know where you begin and I end. And we need that sense of the other. We need that sense of longing, that desire. It's like, you know, fire can't be created without a little bit of air. We need some space between you and me, but we've just really created these mesh dynamics that it's like all attachment, stay attached, get back in these bunkers yeah. and be attached. But if I don't sort of believe that you're like meant to be this other, um, then I can't desire you, you know? This, oof, come on. <laughs> this is so good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is so, so good. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. And I'm going to like, I'm like, give me the thing. I'm so gonna... <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, she so gets it. This is so good. Because, you know, when I, when I, I'm very clear about what I want and need in my life. Mm. And I'm also clear about who I want to be for someone and who I don't want to be for someone when it comes to a romantic relationship and love. And I think for me, my, and I hope this is the correct word in the way that I mean to use it, but like my autonomy is very important to me. Yes. And I want to interchange that with like my sovereignty, like mm. my ability to be myself. I want to think of life through the lens of my human experience mm. while I'm also giving, right? Like I, I've absolutely cultivated an expansive ability to give and receive love. And I learned that profoundly from my child mm. um, and that caring and that nurturing. And I love that. I'm a giver. I'm a lover. Um, but I also need my space. <laughs> and I don't really require a lot. You know, I don't need my problems to be solved. I don't need, you know, to fall apart on someone, at least not all the time, yes. you know, hopefully. But, you know, I think in the way that I see love in life, I'm also looking for an autonomous mm. soul and spirit and, and someone that is very clear about who they are with their interests, with their way to meet their own needs. And we're not looking to like, caretake for each other yes. in the seasons that that's necessary, like mm. tangibly, like realistically necessary. Absolutely. Mm. But not as a full-time job. We can think about ourselves and our individual lives and relationships. That's right. I'm curious how that sounds to you. Tell me if I'm crazy or if that feels <laughs> aligned. <laughs> not only do you not sound crazy, but there's a very specific reason why women of a certain age start to feel such a strong sense of what you're speaking to. Mm. So around 38, 39, mm. all of a sudden, a woman starts to, and you probably know this actually, like there's an astrological shift that happens for us, but all of a sudden we start to come into like this next phase of self, right? Yeah. And we start to like really question, and it's it's very much like what Jung called um, the individuation process, but like there's a specific specific way that it unfolds within the feminine, the core feminine woman, right? And so all of a sudden, it's like all of these things that I've been fed about, like who I need to be to be right. enough and what is true about the world, we just start questioning and we start looking around. And um, I heard something yesterday, you know, you hear something, you're like, oh, that's just kind of 
blew my mind because the like the accuracy. But it was basically saying like as a woman comes into her forties, and you you've always heard like older women speak about like it's right. just all of a sudden like your sense of self gets solidified a little bit more, right? And so I certainly started to feel that, but I just thought like, oh, that's just me. Like, you know, that's just what's happening for me. But it's actually like developmentally what happens for women. Now, what I heard the other day that blew my mind was that like any oppressive structure has to sort of be in this preemptive space of knowing how things unfold to keep keep the systems in place, meaning mm. a patriarchal structure knows this about what happens for women. We start to come into ourselves around our 40s. We start to like come into this immense space of wisdom and self and just confidence. And all of a sudden we're like, we're not interested in being controlled or diminished or needing someone to complete me anymore. I actually am really clear. Like I feel good in my skin. Yeah. I can do that for myself, I right? It's good. Yeah. <laughs> but if you you, you know, think back on like what it felt like when you were younger. A lot of times we didn't have that because developmentally we weren't in that space of individuation yet, right? And so these patriarchal structures know that. And it's a big reason why so much of the programming is around youth and staying young and mm. that you don't want to age. And when you age, that like that's a negative thing and, you know, like puts emphasis. But for women, right? Like we don't hear a lot of emphasis right. on what's negative around men aging. And women are sort of like in this space of like coming into themselves in their 40s. And not only are we meant to feel bad about the fact that we're aging and that our bodies and our faces and whatever start to look different, um, but also that we're bitter. And that's why we're sort of like speaking mm. to all of these things, right? So we sort of program young women to see older women not as like the wise sage elders or, you know, and I would even say like the mystics and the yeah. the enchantress phase of life where we're really sort of like in our inner witch um, coming to yeah. the surface, right? Um, but, but see them as bitter and just like mad that they don't have a man or whatever the right. thing is that I certainly probably would have thought that was true when I heard people talking about like patriarchy or things when I was younger I just it didn't occur to me like that that was that eventually I was going to get older right, and maybe right. be curious about those things but I'm saying all of this to say there's a way that preemptively we sort of have to be in this offensive space of negating whatever the thing is that challenges the system and you see it you know in all of these like white supremacy will do this with calling um you know black people angry and saying like Anytime yeah. they sort of question systems, it's because, you know, they're angry. And so, like, there's all of these, like, narratives that float within the cultural zeitgeist that keeps keep these systems in place. But mm. we're just so, like, breathing them. They're the air that we breathe that we never really question them and say, like, are those women in their 40s bitter? Or are they just, like, not concerned with um, fitting into a box anymore, yeah. right? Um, and so, to me to this point you were making, I think the most potent form of resistance that we can sort of enact as women is sort of saying, one, not only am I going to like embrace what is so unbelievably beautiful about my aging process. I'm like, I'm like a fine wine. I'm like the best I've ever been. What you <laughs> talking about? Like not, not here for that like conversation. I'm like really in the space of loving aging, but also just that like I am loving my life and I think there's so much about whatever the narrative is around our suffering in life um, mm. and this is sort of like where the mindfulness work comes in for me it's it's always debatable right like whatever should be happening or what my marriage should have been or who mm. my partner should be that they're not um, if we can be in the space of questioning and in the inquiry it can really sort of diffuse some of the pain that we're feeling around whatever the thing is because it's always a narrative um, that's debatable. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Oh. Mm. I know. I'm just like, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> like yes. half an hour, but <laughs> very passionate, obviously, about what you're speaking to because yes. I think it's it's important. And to me, we're living through a moment in history that was sort of defined as the Aquarian age was going to be the rise of the feminine consciousness right. and that we were going to come into this awareness that you're talking about earlier in life and that we weren't going to sort of be in this space of um, feeling like we needed to be diminished and that anything wrong was happening. It's like, no, this is the natural order of things yeah. and we're waking up, you know? Yes. Oh God. And, you know, I think, for some people or some ways that, you know, we've looked at society, it's been 
that to take that on means that you want to be masculine or Mm. that you want to like win against men or overpower men in the dynamic. And it's like, no, I just, I want to be left to be myself. Mm. I want to be kind of respected to be myself and interact and participate with love. I want to be in participation actively, creatively with love and with loving. Mm. Um, but I don't also want to be oppressed by it. Um, yeah. And I don't want to be boxed in by it. Yeah. And I don't know if you feel this, but I honestly feel like I have more love for the masculine collective in my space of autonomy than I've ever had in my life. And I think the reason is because as I am a more sovereign being, I am using more discernment with who I am joining in partnership with. And when I join in partnership, because it's justified, it's because my man is like so unbelievably inspiring to me. And I am like thrilled to soften into him. And there's no resentment around doing (laughs) that because I'm like hungry to do it. And it feels so good. Um, I think that that's the thing that we're sort of like not taught to understand about what this process of romantic love can be. God, that's so good. Because we're just so taught, like, if you're alone, there's something wrong. So you better hurry up and get a partner. But if we're really intentional about our partnerships and creating community around us so that, yeah, I have a ton of people in my life. But when I join in partnership with another person, it's because it's so aligned. It's so like on a soul level, what I know for sure, for sure, I'm meant to have for myself that I'm like the softest version of myself. Oh, she's so soft. (laughs) Like what you were saying. Oh, my God. It's so it's so it's so important. Mm. (laughs) It's so important for all of us, for both sides, because I mean, I I just have a tremendous amount of respect for, like, men with integrity. Mm. Like, a tremendous amount of respect and compassion, Mm. love and desire for men in that space. And, (laughs) you know, it's – I think for so long when it came to society and TV and all the things – showing us what the dynamic looked like between women and men it was it was kind of like women needing to please men and being mm-hmm. very anxious about it and how do i get him to notice like be with all these things and yeah. the dynamic you're speaking to which is the true healthy healed whole sovereign dynamic it's really about like we are both these sovereign beings we are both in this container of love in reverence for Mm -hmm. love. And because of that, I'm allowed to just be like a lover girl. I don't have to be pleasing you. I just get to be so (laughs) soft and in lovership and just, you know, like at the highest degree of the way I'm able to care and give. And it feels like ease and it feels like joy and it feels like passion and creativity. Do you know how I know the feminine is rising and I just am like bursting as you say that? I wrote a post where I said something about like the era of the lover girl is returning. Mm. And Debbie, when I tell you that was the most engaged post (laughs) of all time, like because we know and we're so hungry to put down all of these things that are not in alignment with the truth of who we are. And we are love. Like this is our essence and we know that. And it's like, we're just like ready to be that thing. Um, And something else you were saying that I think is really important is just the way that it is important to look at and hold the trajectory of what this has been for men and how much I am just so obsessed with having the conversation around men and how much these patriarchal structures have been really damaging to men. Um, And I think because I have a little boy and Mm -hmm. I never really thought about it until I thought about like the world that I want him to inherit and how much I want him to feel that safety in being his fullest, most embodied self. But there's all these ways that this like protect, provide, procreate, template, and that's all you're meant to do for men um, is just really not allowing them to be a full self either. Right. And I think that that's a little bit where we start to get in trouble in relationships is we've sort of been playing these roles that we've been conditioned to play. And then I love to say like couples get together and it's like we're laying – 
in bed next to someone that we like barely know because it's like right. we've just been playing the roles with one another but not really feeling safe enough to really be the fullest expression of ourselves and so I think you know kind of circling back to what you were saying before it's not that we need to be healed to be in dynamics with another person. But I do think that we need to believe that our energy and the way we're showing up for this relationship dynamic is a hundred percent my responsibility. And so it's not someone else's responsibility to be all of these things for me so that I can believe that I'm whole. That's my job. Right. You better let's run that back. <laughs> Jacquees, yeah. my producer, let's run it back. That entire thing. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> Yeah. And it's so, and from that space, and I just, I love the way that we are slowly walking through and unpacking mm. the depth of your book and the concept, especially of the title, because that is mm. sovereign love. It is not against, it is not two people be behind, you know, these armored walls that right. are trying to fight to be the one that gets to be themselves or gets to be the one whose needs get met. You know, it's the space of like, one, it's a, like love is a privilege. Mm. Like it is a privilege to be in connection for both sides. And at any time, it's a privilege that can be revoked, mm. you know? So when it's there and it's safe and there's space, it's meant to be, you know, the safe opening space for self where you can be reflected um, and reflect and, and, and learn and grow. And I'm such a believer that God... God's intention for us is to learn through relationship and relationship with all things, not just love and partnership, but relationship with everything around you. Mm. I have a relationship with my house. That's it. I have a relationship, you know, with, with my favorite book of poetry. I have a relationship with places I travel and with people and my child and, you know, and I learn about me through every way that I relate to relationship in my life the depth of your awareness. It's just, it's kind of blowing my mind. I was thinking as you were speaking, Debbie, I was like, God, she so gets it. And to me, this is a little bit what is beautiful about divorce, because I think mm. in the same way that any sort of death just gives us a different level of reverence for life. I think the death of a connection um, gives you this opportunity to certainly go back and, you know, look at the black box and really sort of attempt to understand Truly. what happened here. But also there's like a rebirth of the way that I hold this. And I find yeah. those who have experienced love and experienced loss just have like a different level of consciousness with what they're bringing. And that's often why if you look at people's relationships when they're in like their later in life marriage partnership, they're so content and grateful and present with one another. But also what I've seen is like their expectations of the other person are so low because they're yeah. just like settled in their skin yeah. in a different way, you know. So we've been kind of speaking of it in the context of, you know, kind of like mid to late thirties and beyond mm. for anyone listening, who's kind of on the younger end of the spectrum and might be at, you know, more of the beginning stages of yeah. coming into that, those depth relationships, what is a way that they can start working with this material? So they get it through in the first pass. <laughs> I, mean, I love this question. And in some ways I feel like we're in such a moment of like the children shall lead them. Like the mm. younger generation is just in my experience, so conscious and questioning and challenging oh these paradigms yeah. in a way that we just didn't feel safe to, or it just, they weren't the conversations we were having, right? Um, but I think all of these like gender binary conversations and um, like what relationships can look like outside of what we saw and not working well for our parents' generation, they're already having them. And they're sort yeah. of like, you know, there's like these Pew Research studies where they were asking all of these young people about like getting married and they were sort of like, why? Um, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Now, I think 
to me, and this is just like a hypothesis I have, I believe that we are going to shift into a time where partnership is not going to be the baseline. It's going to be like we are in community with one another again. It's going to be more of a collectivist way of being. And then when Mm. our soul paths are so unbelievably aligned, the mission for what we came into these bodies to do is just like in sync. Then we're going to come together in partnership because it's so potent and fiery there. Um, And I think that like our kids' generation, that's going to be what their relationship structures look like. But I think it's going to be more in the space of like, like you were saying, like I am in relationship to so many things, to so many people, um, with a little bit more of a conscious reverence for like what all of these relationship dynamics are teaching me about me, but that I'm not looking for someone to complete me anymore. Like we're not doing that anymore. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Oh, mm. I want to just to sit in the fibers of the book for a second. I kind of, I want to read for everybody some of the synopsis from the book, and then I have a few technical questions. <laughs> so the about of sovereign love is as a marriage and family therapist, sovereign love is Danae Logan's perspective on how we begin to heal from an unspoken war of the sexes Mm. that's been playing out in our relationships. Mm. She shares the patterns she sees playing out in the couples that she works with and how growing up in a patriarchal society has affected us all. Sovereign love teaches you about the work of integrating Mm. your own masculine and feminine energetics so that you can create healthy polarity in your relationships. Put down the practice of codependency and experience a greater sense of wholeness within. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, oh, and I know so many are are already resonating with the language, but if you would kind of those energetics Mm. that live within each of us, that polarity, that, you know, God, (sighs) the yin, the yang, the light, the dark, the masculine, the feminine, um, the grief, the joy, Mm. like, we are always integrating opposites. That's That's why we're here. (laughs) And how I, and if, you know, and I know obviously this is in the book, so get the book, get the book, get the book. (laughs) But can you describe for those listening, what is that polarity inside men and women? What do we experience as our inner masculine and feminine? Mm. And how does that play into how we are able to show up or not in relationship? Mm -hmm. Well, so as we were talking about before, I believe there's so much about our our society as it has been, that's been like a really wounded masculine paradigm. And so that's like really like competitive productivity at all costs. Um, you know, just sort of like pull yourself up by your bootstraps and like really like disengaged from our inner world in Mm. so many ways. Like that's like the societal paradigm that's been normalized. And a lot of times, like the things that we revere, like, especially in Western culture, like we really sort of like, you know, this thing of like working ourselves until we're sick, not having any like vacation days, that's really like, those are like the things that we value societally. Um, Now, when it comes to feminine energy, we really think of feminine energy with a lot of contempt. And a lot of what we believe is feminine energy is really a distortion of feminine energy. Mm. So that's sort of like the insecure, clingy, um, you know, codependent, like anxious, like need someone else to complete me energy. We think of that as feminine energy. And, you know, as we were saying before, that's in all of us. Like we will all sort of do this dance between our wounded masculine and feminine energetics. But what I started to understand is like we're a society that doesn't really have any sort of like conceptualization of what these dynamics are and look like Mm. from a healthy perspective. And you know, certainly with masculine energy, we don't even know or have models of what healthy masculinity looks like really. Um, and so when we think about like, what is healthy masculinity, that is a sense of self, that is confidence, that is a mission that is like, I am rooted in what I know I'm here to do. And Mm. I got me no matter what. Right. And that's in all of us. That's the like moving forward from the space of uh, inspired action versus how it looks from the outside. Right. Mm -hmm. Like from a space rooted from within. But then this beautiful, healthy, feminine energetic is the energetic within all of us that like, if I think of feminine energy, the first word that comes to mind is always trust because Mm. 
the feminine energy is like the source energy within all of us. It is the the aspect of us that is like connected to the divine. And so that is like the receptive energy. That is the part of us that believes that we can um, trust our intuition, trust our internal guidance system and know that we will be held. It's the part of us that trusts in life, allows ourselves to play and be free mm. and embodied all of these beautiful aspects of our feminine. But all of us need to like really have both of those energetics alive and dancing and integrated within us. But we can't really have that until we not only have an understanding of what those energetics are and how they show up, but what it looks like tangibly to take responsibility for our own energy. And that's really what I try to walk people through um, in the book, like that we are actually able not only to take responsibility for our own energy in any given moment, but what's amazing about couples work is when we take responsibility for our own energy, and this isn't just in romantic relationships, it's in relationships in general, inevitably we will create polarity. We'll create um, healthy polarity. So just like a quick example of Please. what that can look like. Yeah. So let's say that I'm like, you're like in a, we're, we're going to pretend like we're like battling in wounded polarity for a moment, okay. right? So if you were like in wounded feminine energetic and you're just like constantly like wanting more from me, telling me that like, you know, you just like want to hang out more and I'm, I'm just like not meeting your needs. And like, there's all of these ways that you're feeling like you want more from me, but I'm not giving it to you. And it's making you feel insecure and unhappy in this relationship. And so I'm in wounded masculine energy and I'm just like really irritated and like, oh, you're always pulling on me and you're so needy. And I'm like really trying to build something at work. And why don't you understand? And I'm just like really in this like guarded, wounded, masculine paradigm with you. My work is to shift um, into my healthy feminine. So if I'm in wounded masculine, I go into my healthy feminine. And that's me in the space of vulnerability. So I get still and I like really say, okay, like what is it that Debbie's doing that like I'm telling myself a story about? I take up space. The feminine is like the spaciousness. So I take up space with the truth of how this feels for me. I mm -hmm. say the vulnerable thing. I say, you know, the story I'm telling myself is that like no matter what I do, it's never enough for you. And that reminds me maybe of the way that like my mom always criticized me. Like we get into like mm -hmm. the vulnerable conversation and I take up space with that. And what will inevitably happen is as I take up space in my healthy feminine, you will start to create healthy masculine containment for me. And so you will see me in this vulnerable space and you'll be like, oh, Danae, I wasn't trying to make you feel that way. All of a sudden you got me. You're containing me. Um, you're like, I see you. I see how I'm making you feel. That was not my intention. And we start to be in that dance. Now, here's the important caveat, because a lot of times people will say, well, how do I get my husband to get into that? <laughs> like, <help me?" laughs> That's not what we're doing here. When I say take 100% responsibility for your energy, I mean 100% responsibility for your energy, not your husband's energy. And we will inevitably create healthy polarity when we take responsibility for our energy, but energy is one of those things we can't fake. Like we can't mm. manipulate energy. So if I am fully in the space of shifting into my healthy feminine, inevitably you will sort of start to like shift into that space of containment. But if you can't and you won't, that's really important information for me to have. Like if mm. someone is just like determined to not be in like healthy polarity with me, then yeah. that's information about like how much we're going to be able to find harmony in this relationship. And I need to know that. <sighs> need to know that and need to not respond to it like a challenge. <laughs> mm, right. Like I will make you get I into will, this Yeah, space I'm going to win this. Yeah. 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 Because really that comes from it. A wounded space within me that believes like if this person can just love me the way I desire to be loved, then that will mean I'm worthy. Oh, Lordy. <laughs> <laughs> right. what, are, what are some things that more people in general need to evaluate when they think about love? Mm. I love that question. I think in general, we have just a distorted idea of what love is. You know, mm. I think so often, like even we were talking about before, if you look on social media and the way people talk about love, it's like, find a person who does this for you. Like right. the you're the one will like inevitably know how to do X, Y, and Z for you. Um, so love is really about what I get from someone else yeah. is everything that we're taught to believe. I don't think that's true. I believe love is about what I am giving to mm. you. And, you know, I think since my marriage ended, my definition of love, when I really like got in there and like got in the like unpacking of love and relationships, 
really shifted. And today, um, what I think of when I think of love is just the idea that your soul is safe with me. Mm. And what that means to me is that like whatever your soul came here to carry out in terms of its soul mission for you to be the fullest embodiment of who you have the potential to be in this lifetime. I want that for you because I love you and I don't want to interfere with that. Even if that means that you are meant to journey on in grace without me, I love you. So, you know, I start out the book with this quote by Maya Angelou where she talks about like love liberates. It doesn't bind. It doesn't Mm. hold someone here demanding that you stay and be who I need you to be. Love loves you. And I love the idea that like my love for you is for me. That actually has nothing to do (laughs) with anything you're giving or doing or being. I love you. That's that's what it means to love. And I think, yes, if both people feel that, then there's reciprocity and it's a beautiful relationship dynamic. But I think love is more about my experience of you than your experience of me. That is so gorgeous. Mm, Thank you. That is so, 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 so gorgeous. That is love. Mm. That is love. Oh, I really, I just really urge everyone listening that's resonating um, to really start thinking about exploring, going on some kind of rabbit hole deep dives of what does love actually mean to you and what has been perhaps performance or what has been societal programming or what has been, you know, a barrier against what, what does it actually mean? What does it look like? What can it be? Because I think, and, and to the way that you just so beautifully express that love is love mm. and we keep trying to give love different definitions depending on where we apply it mm. so it's like love means this when i'm in love with a a partner in romance but then love between me and my child is like this or yeah. love between me and a friend or my self love is like this love is one thing Love is one thing. Love is love. And it has to be universally applied in its true nature um, and in its true in its true context. So it's like if there are different expectations of what love is, looks like how it feels, depending on who you're attributing that word to or with, that's something to look at. It should not be that faceted and compartmentalized in different ways and categorized it's, it's love. It just is. And I love what you're saying so much because I think the more work that we do to bring the focus back inward and understand, you know, there's this roomy quote that like our task is not to seek for love, but Mm. merely to seek and find all the barriers we've built within ourselves against it. Right. And I think that I love that quote, right? (laughs) So good. Um, And I think when we like boil it down and like just start like, you know, to me, the healing is just like a returning to the essence of who we really are. And we are love, period. You know, Um, one of my favorite writers, Jaya John, has this, I don't know, butcher it, but he has this quote that's sort of like, ocean need not seek water. Mm. You don't need to seek love outside of yourself. You are love. Our work is just to remember Mm. that and to start to pour love (laughs) into every space we enter a little bit more. But that really requires us going inward and doing the work to understand where did I like come up with all these barriers that are keeping me from loving. Mm. Two of um, my teachers from some years ago used to start every one of our workshops with that Rumi quote. Mm. And then they'd say at the end of it, they'd add their piece in that they added, which was to find all the barriers against it. And then they would add and to dissolve them. And they would say that every time, Mm. like so like, so deliberate, so pronunciated, you know, it was just, and to dissolve them. And I always love that because it gives you the beautiful responsibility of that, which means you can do it. That's, Uh, that's gorgeous, but so good. (laughs) So as we, as we get ready, although I would love to continue this show for hours and days, um, (laughs) so excited to find you sister. You are just like pure gold. (laughs) We are hanging. Um, I would love if you could share at the end of every episode, I like to invite our guests to share a piece of soul work Mm. with everyone listening, a way to integrate 
this conversation, a way to experience it in the in-between time until mm-hmm. the next episode. So um, whether it is a practice from the book, something from your heart or an inquiry, anything that you would like to let the audience savor as this episode ends. Mm. I love that. You know, I was thinking about earlier that there's this thing that Eckhart Tolle speaks to where he talks about whenever you're experiencing something difficult, make the decision to be in radical acceptance of this as if you chose it, because on some level you did. And I got to tell you, Debbie, like making that the practice of my life has changed everything, whatever it's going through or whatever I'm going through, whatever the situation is. If I get into the space of getting still and ask myself, like, why is my higher self making this the assignment, Um, Mm. you know, giving me this as the instruction of something that I meant to go through? Mm then all of a sudden, like the resistance just starts to dissolve to use that word. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just like a practice that we can bring in. Like life's, life's going to be life in, right? Like things are going to happen. And when the things that we would rather not be the case are the inevitable reality, how can I be in the space of like radical acceptance if, as if I chose this, because on some level I did. (sighs) big work. <laughs> yeah, big work. Juicy, juicy, juicy work. Mm. Spend time thinking about that invitation, everyone. Um, and journal to that in a few different ways. Write down some thoughts as you're hearing and it's circulating right now. And then consider tomorrow, read it, mm. jot down a little bit more the next day and spend the week with it. Spend some time with it. Give it give it some space. How can everyone connect with you in your work? Thank you. Um, As you mentioned earlier, I have a podcast called Cheaper Than Therapy. And my friend Vanessa Bennett, who's also a therapist, and I have a community, the Cheaper Than Therapy community, where people can come in and do group therapy and group work and processing um, in just like a really beautiful community that we've built. And um, yeah, and then I do a lot of, you know, um, sharing of the content that we record and um, on retreats and things on social media. So that just and feels what's like your Instagram. Oh, it's Danae, D E N E dot Logan, L O G A N. And I have this book coming out called Sovereign Love. Sovereign Love. It is available. I'm going to hold it. Up. Oh, excuse me, microphone. Um, it is available in all the places you get books. <laughs> so make sure to get this book, spend some time with it. This is. This is the work of our lives, mm. love and relationship in all forms. Thank you. Thank you for for just the way you're showing up for this life. I can feel it in mm. your energy. It's just really, really beautiful to be in your presence. Thank you. Mm. Thank, thank you. you. <sighs> Until next time, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us. Namaste. Namaste.